Hello, and welcome to DryDoc, Techniques for Not Repeating Yourself in Docker Files. Um, my name is Micah June Culpepper. I work for a hosting company where I write some Python applications, and I maintain some things that run in Docker containers. And today I'm going to talk to you about a problem that I have. First, before we get into the weeds of what the problem is, I'm going to go over a very basic introduction to what Docker files are and why we might have these problems. If you're already familiar uh, with Docker files and Docker in general, then uh, you may not need this part. Uh, but just so that this is approachable to everyone, um, or for those who have been using Docker files but weren't really sure exactly what they did or why they needed to have them. So, we're going to say that Docker is a system for running VMs. That's not quite accurate, but for the sake of explanation, it's close enough. So a Docker VM is called a container. And if you want to have a Docker VM running, then you go to your console and you type Docker run with some extra arguments to start up that VM. And so the running VM is called a container. Now, in order to run this VM, you first need to have the VM's file system, or the image, existing on disk. Now, Docker images can come from a lot of places. There are some good publicly available images if you want to run something like Linux or Nginx or Python. Um, there are plenty of publicly available images. However, for most production purposes, you're going to want to make your own image either completely for, from scratch with tons of customization or by taking one of those off-the-shelf publicly available images and adding a little bit of customization on top, even if it's just simply copying your application into it. Next, if you want to create one of these images yourself, what you need to do is you need to run the docker build command and that will produce an image on disk according to your instructions but you don't give all the instructions in the docker build command, you supply instructions to docker build in a docker file. And the docker files are what we're here to talk about today. So taking it from the top, you begin with your docker file, which is configuration or code that you write, and then you use that to build an image and then you use the image to run a container for whatever purpose you're trying to solve. So to give you an example, here is a Flask app, and this is just a very simple demonstration purposes example of sort of the minimum required to get a Docker container running. So first we have our Python file, and this is just a tiny little hello world web server. And then this is the Docker file that we would use to produce an image to run our hello world server. Now in the Docker file, the way I have my syntax highlighting set up here is all of the orange words, the first word in each line, uh, are the Docker file directives or the commands that you have to work with in the sort of Docker file domain specific language. So the first line there says from Python 3.8. Now normally the first line in a Docker file is going to say from, it doesn't have to, but usually it does. And that describes the base image that you are working from. So we're saying go out and get the publicly available Python 3.8 image, and then we're going to build on top of that. Now, keep in mind what I just said is that we are building on top of it. In other words, we are building up layers on layers on layers. That's actually key to how Docker works. So the next line that we run there is run pip3 install flask. So that's just going to install our Python dependency. Then we're going to copy app.py from the host machine where we are building this image into the image. And then we're going to export an environment variable that we need for this to work. And then we're going to set our default command so that when you run this uh, image in the future, when you start a container based off of it, by default, it's going to run Flask. So here's an example of actually building that container in real life and then running it. Now you'll notice that when I ran the docker build command there, it completed almost instantly, and you see a lot of lines where it says using cache, using cache. 
Docker has a lot of caching systems built in, and that's kind of key to how it works. So in this case, the build completed instantly because I had already done the build on my computer for testing purposes. If you were following along at home and doing the same command that I did, it might take a little bit longer for it to actually build up the image. But once the image has been built, I use my docker run command with some additional arguments. And that actually starts a container based off of the image that I just produced. And it gives me the hash of the running container there. And now that that's running, I can curl localhost and I get the hello world message. So that shows you that my server really is running. And that's about as simple as it gets for building your own Docker images and deploying them. Now back to the point that I made earlier about layers. Docker images are made up of layers and each line in your Docker file makes a new layer. So when you download a publicly available image, that is one layer that you are starting with. And often that publicly available image is actually a list of many layers that build on top of each other. And then as you customize it, you are adding more layers on top of that. What this means is that similar images can share disk space. So let's say that you have 10 applications that all need a Python 3.8 image and they need Flask installed and then they only differ at the very end where they're actually copying that Flask application into the container's disk space, this is great because on disk, the images, because they share uh, some layers in common, don't take up, you know, 10 images worth of space. They only take up maybe like one and a half images worth of space. Um, and again, running containers can all be based off of one image. So if for some reason you did want to have an image that was actually identical for multiple applications, you could do that. Now I'm going to start to introduce you to the problem. These are real files from my work and let's, let's go through them and see if you can see what I'm seeing. So first we have from CentOS 7, so this is a application that decided it wanted to run on CentOS 7 for whatever reason, okay. And then we're installing Apple, we're doing some updates, we're installing Python, we're installing our Python dependencies, we're pip installing our package, we're setting some environment variables, and we're setting our CMD at the end. These are all fine. These are relatively normal things that you would have in a Docker file. But let's look at this next one. So here's another Docker file from a different project where we're starting with CentOS 7 and we're installing Apple and we're doing our updates and we're installing Python and we're installing our Python dependencies. Can you see how in the previous Docker file and then in the new Docker file, we're essentially doing the same thing, but these files have nothing to do with one another. Here's another example. In this application, for whatever reason, we decided we wanted to run on Alpine Linux. Not a bad choice, just a choice. And we're doing basically the same thing here. We're doing our updates. We're installing our application. So what this tends towards uh, is a situation where we have multiple applications that have essentially the same system requirements. They just need Linux and they need Python packages. But the layers that build up all of these images are completely different. So what we started to do to try to solve this was we came up with a base image. And the base image has installed on it Linux, Python, it's got patches, and a couple of other things that we needed in order for things to run correctly in our environment. And so this Docker file starts with the base image that we made, and then it installs our package, and that's about it. So, okay, this file is getting a little bit shorter. We're starting to repeat ourselves less. But then look at this one. Here's another approach to doing the same thing. 
this file starts from scratch and then it copies the entire file system out of the base image into this image and then kind of does the same things that we normally want to do on top of that. It's installing Python dependencies and it's installing a Python package and it's setting our CMD. So really the problem that I'm talking about and that I've been working to solve at my job is that of Dockerfile repetition. The problem with having Dockerfile repetition is not maybe immediately obvious, but you start to see it after you've been running an environment for a while with applications whose Docker files were all over the place to begin with and didn't have any configuration standards. What this means is that you don't know what your configuration standards are. You can't count on things being the same from one image to the next. And are you doing security patching? Did you harden these containers at all? How would you know? Did you do it to one of them or to all of them? Another common problem is that bug fixes and enhancements to one app's Docker file don't get applied to other apps. This is the same problem that you have when there's code proliferation anywhere else. If you're not refactoring it to use some kind of shared library, updates don't get everywhere that they should get. And then again, the same problem that I mentioned earlier with the way Docker layering works, if you have you know, 20 different applications that all essentially just need Linux, Python, and a couple other things, but each one is a unique snowflake in terms of its layer makeup, you're wasting a lot of disk space. And there's just the mental overhead. If you're trying to maintain this environment, or if you're trying to develop applications that go into this environment, how do you know which of the different Docker files that exist you should be copying and pasting into your project? And how do you know what troubleshooting tools are available to you if you need to inspect one of these containers? It just, it gets more complicated than it has any right to be. This all leads to sad whales. And we don't want sad whales. That's what we're here today to prevent. So, the principle of don't repeat yourself, or sometimes you'll hear it uh, phrased reference don't copy, is something that we're very familiar with as programmers. And it seems bad that all of our Docker files are repeating themselves and doing basically the same thing in a myriad of different ways. So we're trying to think of ways that we can not repeat ourselves in Docker files. And for that, it helps to look at Python. In Python, which is something that we are more familiar with, we have these excellent tools for not repeating ourselves. We can use functions, we can use classes, and we can use modules. Now it's not immediately obvious how to use these principles in a Docker file, because Docker files don't have these things. You can't really define a Docker file function or class or module. You can't import a Docker file from another Docker file. But let's think for a minute about what we're really doing here. When you define a function in Python, what you're saying is, here's my function def. I'm gonna write some code now, but it's not gonna execute now. We're just gonna load it into memory we'll use it later. Same thing with classes. Here is a template for an object that we could make, but we're not making one of these objects right now. And same thing with modules. Typically, when you import a module, you are just getting a bunch of definitions for code that you could use. Now, there are some modules that actually do things when you import them, but we're going to pretend those don't exist for the moment. So what we're looking for is a way to write code now and save execution for later. And actually, Docker does provide us a couple of tools that help achieve that. We have args and onbuild to help dry up our Docker files. So first, let's talk about args. Args is a Docker file directive. This declares a variable that can be used later in the Docker file, and the values of the variables come from arguments to Docker build. 
So this is what it would look like in a Docker file. You just have arg and then the name of the argument that you want. And that's basically just declaring a variable that we are expecting whoever is building this image to supply at build time. Here's an example of using uh, an argument. Now, in Docker, uh, when you're building an image, typically you have a Docker file on disk that you are supplying. You can also just type a Docker file into standard out. Um, that's fine for demo purposes, so you can see exactly what we're doing. So here, I'm just making a new Docker image, and I'm starting from a Linux base, and I'm saying I'm declaring an argument of name, and then we're just going to run hello name. Now you can see down there under step three of three, it says hello Micah. And I didn't actually type Micah anywhere in the Docker file itself, I supplied Micah as a build arg up here. So that's one way that when you're writing your Docker files, you can include variables, and then those have to be supplied at build time. Now here's a slightly more powerful example. You can use arguments in scripts. So the run command in a Docker file is essentially just executing a shell command. And that shell command can include control structures like you'd normally use in good old bash. And so you can create an argument of, let's say, venv, because we're saying that inside this image, we may want to create a virtual environment, or we may not. We're going to let the user decide that when they build the container. So if there is an argument of venv, then we're going to create a Python virtual environment at the given path. And if not, then we don't. So that's a way to use one Docker file that could do multiple things depending on the arguments that are supplied at build time. Now, earlier I mentioned that from does not have to be the first line in a Docker file. Now, until you use from, there are a lot of things that you can't do. So usually it's going to be very high up on uh, in the order of things. But you can do something like this. You can actually have arguments where the user supplies variables that influence the base of this image. So let's say, for example, that I had some test suite that I needed to run on multiple flavors of Linux. Well, I could create a Docker file, and in that Docker file have a run command that runs my test suite. And then at the beginning of the Docker file, I actually accept arguments for which version of Linux this needs to run on. And then you can use the same Docker file and literally just loop through a list of uh, distributions that you want to run these tests for and run docker build with slightly different arguments and not have to write a completely different docker file for each Linux version that you want to test on. All right, now moving on to the on build directive. This was the other thing that helps us to dry up our docker files. On build goes before other directives like add and it turns those directives into triggers. Triggers are run when a child image is built. So add by itself is a very common Docker file directive that's basically just copying files over. Typically when you're building an image, you're going to copy some files from the build host into the container. Maybe it's the application itself. Maybe it's some configuration files. But putting the word on build in front of it modifies add so that we are no longer running add when we get to that point in the Docker file. What we're doing is we are staging an add command for the future so that if somebody builds another image based on the image that we are currently building, then it runs add. So here's an example of this. We're going to start off by building just a very simple image that includes an on build add command. Uh, I'm sorry, an on build run command. So you can see how we 
can load a trigger for future use. So I put in work dir there, so that's literally just creating a directory called demo and changing to it. We're gonna run ls, and then we're gonna say on build add dot dot. Now you can see in the ls output there under step three of four, there's nothing in this directory. It's just showing dot and dot dot like you would normally see. Now we're gonna build a new Docker image based off of the one that we just ran. So we're gonna say from demo base latest, the thing we just created. And we're just gonna run ls-al and that's it. Now you can see in the output there, it says step one of two from demo base latest executing one build trigger. That's that on build that we staged earlier. And the on build trigger, if you remember, was add dot dot. In other words, copy everything from the current working directory on the host into the image. And then step two of two is run ls-al. So we just list the contents and hey, look, there's files there now. I copied stuff over. So this is how you can pre-stage things that you know your child images or your inheritor images are going to need. So now here's another example, I'm trying to put some of these concepts together. We're gonna start off with Debian 10 Slim, so just a standard Linux image. And we're going to say on build arg, because you can combine those depths. So on build, tell me what your dependencies are. And then on build run, install those dependencies. We've just taken a very common step from all those Docker files that I was showing you earlier, and we've moved it into a parent image. So now, if I want to build a child image, I can just do docker build, and then here's my build argument. I need curl and libssl dev for this application that I'm building today. So for this to work, we have to do from demo base, that's our parent image that we just built. And then you can see it's executing two build triggers, that's some apt output, it's actually installing the things that we asked it to install. So now, we don't need to have proliferation of 50 different Docker files that all install curl and libssl and whatever else we need for the application that we're building today. We can just have those as arguments that get passed into a base image. So here's some ideas that I have of how you can use all of these concepts in practice to actually stop repeating yourself in Docker files. Uh, you can have a single, doc single Docker file that manages dependencies for multiple apps, and you can have a single Docker file that handles testing or packaging operations for multiple Linux distro versions. Now, to get the benefit of this, what you need to do is maintain a base image. Now, maybe uh, the way that you and your team work um, you just need one base image and you standardize everything on that. Maybe there are multiple common stacks that you work with, and so you need three or five base images. But I think that the important thing is to pick or create base images and then standardize on them. Um, when you're doing this, when you're making the switch to uh, basically deduplicate your Docker files and move to a standard, you want to use dash dash pull in all of your downstream build commands. Because by default, when you use docker build, it's just going to use the latest version of the from line there of your base image that it has cached on disk already. So adding dash dash pull to your docker build command is going to make it always check for the latest first so that when you do apply patches and updates, they make it into your downstream containers. Here's an example at my work. Now, unfortunately, this is a, a private image. You can see it's a Rackspace.net uh, host name there. It has some things in it that would not be appropriate for a general audience, and so that's why I haven't open sourced it. But it uses all the concepts that I've talked about in this presentation. 
And it means that our individual applications Docker files can look like this. They can just be two lines. They can say, use the base image. Here's the command that I need. Done. And walk away. So this has gotten me to a point where I'm happy with the state of Docker files in our environment. And I hope that these are some tips and tricks that can help you. Thank you very much to Dustin Ingram and the other organizers of PyTexas for letting me speak with you today. Happy to be here, and I am available for uh, questions and comments uh, through the rest of PyTexas, and always on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>